verse 1. And David gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. And David rose and went with all the people that were with him from Baali of Judah to bring up from thence the ark of God, whose name is called by the name of the Lord of hosts that dwelleth between the cherubims. And they set the ark of God upon a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab that was in Gibeah. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drave the new cart. And they brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which is at Gibeah, accompanying the ark of God. And Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel played before the Lord on all manner of instruments made of fir wood, even on harps and on psalteries and on timbrels and on cornets and on cymbals. And when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen shook it. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God smote him there for his error, and there he died by the ark of God. And David was displeased because the Lord had made a breach upon Uzzah. And he called them just a simple white tent. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. And as the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord. And she despised him in her heart. And they brought in the ark of the Lord and set it in his place in the midst of the tabernacle that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before the Lord. And as soon as David had made an end of offering burnt offerings and peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord of hosts. And he dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, as well to the women as men, to everyone a cake of bread and a good piece of flesh and a flagon of wine. So all the people departed everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, Notice it keeps referring to her as the daughter of Saul. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered himself. And David said unto Michael, It was before the Lord which chose me before thy father and before his house to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel. Therefore will I play before the Lord. I want you to notice how he says, before the Lord, people of the Lord. Therefore will I play before the Lord. I want you to notice what Michael says. Look at the way you uncover yourself in front of the people. Michael was focused on what the people thought. David was focused on what God thought. In verse 22, and I will yet be more vile than thus. Now in that context, he's saying, I'm going to be more humble. That's what he means by that. And will be base in my own sight. And of the maidservants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child unto the day of her death. And just to understand what that means, Michael did have children by someone else, and David had children by other people. So when it says Michael had no child with David her death, it's referring to the fact that she had no relationship with David. It wasn't that she couldn't have children. And I want to go back to verse 16. I want you to look at that one phrase, she despised him in her heart. And the title of the message is, Be a David, not a Michael. Be a David, not a Michael. Let's pray. Father, I ask that you would fill me with your spirit now as I speak. Father, I pray that we would not misunderstand this passage, that we would not think of it in a different way than what it really is teaching us. And Father, that we would understand its meaning to us. And I, Father, I pray that we would be Davids. A Dells Baptist Church would be a church of people that wants to please God and is in love with God and is not worried about what people think of us. Father, that we would not want Christianity to be a show where we're trying to look good in public to please people. That was what Saul did. And that was all that Michael knew, was just looking good in public for other people. But that would be like David, and we would want the Ark of God, which is God's presence, to be in our lives. And we would want to please God and obey Him and we would not care what people think of us. 
that we would be a David and not a Michael. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat>
the Ark was just left at someone's house in Gibeah, Saul, the Bible says. And Saul was not walking with God. Now I want you to understand what the Ark pictures. The Ark is a picture of fellowship with God. God said to Moses when they were going to make the Ark, he said, There will I meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from between the cherubim and above the mercy seat, which is upon the tavern, the, the testimony which I give thee commandment of the children of Israel. So the ark was picturing fellowship with God. And David loved God and he wanted to have fellowship with God. Saul couldn't care less about having fellowship with God because Saul was just trying to rule the kingdom, get his way, do what he wanted. But David loved God and he wanted to have fellowship with him. So one of the first things that David did when he became king is he says, let's bring the ark to Jerusalem. The ark represented fellowship with God. So David brings the ark, but of course, here's the problem. The problem is, under the time of Saul, they weren't obeying the law. They weren't doing what God said. Saul didn't read the law. He didn't teach them to obey the law. Saul was being disobedient. And so the Philistines had put the ark in a cart. And so they were just, that was how they were transporting it ever since then. For years after that, they always put the ark in the cart. But you weren't, they weren't supposed to put it in a cart. They were supposed to have the priests bear the ark. And that's because God doesn't dwell. God's presence, God's fellowship is not where man does his thing, but it's where God's people are. And the priests are a picture of New Testament believers. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name, they're in the midst of them. That's why God wanted the priests to carry it. But the other reason why the priests should carry the ark is if one priest stumbled and fell, there are three other priests holding the ark and it won't fall. But when you have it on a cart, if something happens to the cart, the whole ark falls over. So that's what happened in the story as we read. Um, they're coming into this coming near the city of Jerusalem, and the ark, the oxen stumble, start to fall, and the, the ox, the cart shakes, and then the ark starts to tip over. And this person who has been helping take care of the ark all these years, he's not following God's instructions for how to take care of the ark. He puts out his hand to stop it, and God strikes him dead right there because no one was allowed to touch the ark. They knew that. We've talked about this in our Thursday night, but the reason why um no one allowed, was allowed to touch that ark except the people that had been told to do it the right way is because <clears throat> if anyone could do whatever they wanted, um, then that would not be picturing the fact that only born-again Christians can have fellowship with God. So David gets scared because here David's he's in this great mood and he's like, hey, and he's, he's excited that they're bringing the ark. He wants to have fellowship with God. But the thing is, he can't have fellowship without obedience. And because they were disobeying God, they couldn't have fellowship with God. So what happened is, um, they just took the ark and they go went and put it aside at the house of this person named Obed Edom the Gittite. Now, Gittite is someone from Gath. This is probably a friend of David's that when he was living in Gath, when he was, um, there were like 600 different men that were called Gittites that fought with David. They were Philistines who had joined up with David and, and, and uh, they had become um, followers of God and they lived in Israel now with David. And so they put it in his house. And they're all scared. It says, David, you, read what, you heard what I read. The David, David was afraid of the Lord. How shall the Lord come to me? And see, this is what happens to us. We have times in our lives where we sin, we do wrong. And then God brings chastening. And when God brings chastening, it's very easy for us to get offended and scared and go, I don't know about this Christianity thing because it's not working out for me. Or we get upset that something bad happened. And we're tempted to not want to have fellowship with God. That's what happens, isn't there? When there's sin in church, when there's sin in our lives, and then something bad happens, we experience negative consequences of our sin. You know what we do? We go, well, I don't know if I want to have fellowship with God then. That's what happens. As this happened here, God judged Uzzah, and David was upset. He was displeased. He was upset that Uzzah got killed. He's thinking, God, we're trying to honor you by bringing the ark into Jerusalem, and then you go kill this guy? So he's kind of unhappy with God, but he's also it says he was afraid of the Lord. He said, how shall the ark of the Lord come to me? And see, that happens to us too, where, you know, maybe when you're a kid, you know, your dad, you did something wrong and your dad gave you the what fur. And you know what happened? After you got punished, you're kind of like, I don't know if I want to be about my dad. But you know what you find out over time? Your dad loves you. He only chases you because he loves you. And he, you can still have fellowship with him. And we have to learn that as Christians. We go through ups and downs in our lives. We sin. We fail. Other people sin and fail. And God brings chastening. And God brings judgment. But that doesn't mean that we should be scared and give up and go, I don't want to be a Christian. I don't want to follow learning more. I don't want to fellowship with God. No. God wants fellowship with us. But the fellowship has to be based on obedience. Just like fellowship with your parents was based on obedience when you were a child. 
And so what happens is, this is really interesting. David goes, okay, we're just going to leave the ark there at that person's house. And he leaves obed -Edom. Well, then it says for three months, God blesses that person's house. And I don't know what all happened. I don't know if all his wives had triplets. I don't know what happened. <laughs> or hey, how many wives he had. I don't know if all of his cows got really big really quick. Uh, if all the chickens had a, whole, if he had a whole bunch of eggs. I don't know what happened. It says he was only there for three months. It says the Lord blessed the house of obed -Edom. And it was so dramatic, the blessing that everybody was talking about it. And so David goes, wait a minute. If he's getting blessed, that means God still loves us. And God, God still wants us to have fellowship. And David's thinking this, wait a minute. Uzzah was struck dead because he was disobeying God. But Obed-Edom's not disobeying God. The ark just parked next to his house or wherever it was, maybe in a corner of his house or something. And now God's blessing Obed-Edom. And David's like, oh, God wants to bless me. You see... When you're a child and you do wrong and your parents punish you, it's not because they don't love you. They love you. They want to bless you, but they can't bless disobedience. But when you make things right, you get back to your parents, God will, your parents will bless you. And God is the same way. God actually wants to bless you, but we have to be in obedience in order to be blessed. So when we get punished or when we get chastened, that's not the time to get, oh, give up, forget it, God, you're too hard to serve, Christianity is too difficult, I can't. No, we're supposed to go, okay, let's correct what we're doing wrong, and then let's go back and get in fellowship with God again. Let's go out fellowship. So what happened is David says, God's blessing obed Edom. And he goes, hey, I want some of that blessing. So David goes and he gets the ark, and here's what they do. He says, this is not in here. It does say that they that bear the ark. So you know they were carrying it right this time. But if you go over to uh, Chronicles, it actually tells you that David said, none ought to carry the ark except the Levites. He said that. And he told the Levites, we sought him not up to do order. That's why the Lord brought a breach upon us. So if you read other passages that refer to this, you see that that's what's going on. So David says, we got to obey God and then he'll bless us. He gets the point. So he gets a priest to carry the ark and now they're coming into the temple. Now, do you think of all that he went through? And Uzzah like getting killed and everything David's been through in his life. And now he's like, now that I'm king, I just want Israel to worship God. I just want Israel to have fellowship with God. And he knows that the ark is the place of fellowship. And so he says, let's bring the ark to Jerusalem. So David is so excited. He's so happy because the ark is coming into Jerusalem. And now he knows what happened, what went wrong, and now he fixed it. And that's the way God is with us. God can bless you and he can give you incredible joy after a tragedy, after a disaster, after a problem where you sinned and you've done wrong. God can bless you in an amazing way. But you have to have David's response. And you have to say, okay, we did it wrong. Let's change what we're doing. Instead of blaming God, we have to change what we're doing so that God can bless us. And then we can get in a place of fellowship and joy. But remember, Michael knows nothing of this. Michael has never seen this. All she knows is the dad that she had and her idea of the way a king is supposed to be. That's the setting of this situation. So they're coming into Jerusalem. When they that bear the ark of the Lord had gone six paces, he sacrificed oxen and fatlings. So here's these, these, uh, these priests that are carrying the ark. Now they're doing what God said. And they walk six steps and they do a bunch of sacrifices. And they walk six more steps. <laughs> wow. I mean, they're having a huge party. You see, at the end, David's giving out food to everybody, and they're having this huge party. And the whole city is full of joy because they're having fellowship with God. That's the setting. And it says in verse 14, And David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with the linen ephod. And I just have to mention, in the Bible, the kind of dancing that they did, that was a picture of joy. Okay, a lot of the dancing that happens in our culture today is sensual. It's um, male and female together, and it's not. It's for the sake of arousing wrong desires. That's the way dancing works for the most part. Now there is some more traditional folk type dancing, but in the Bible and even in Israeli folk dancing today, the men dance separate than the women. I tell you a little joke about that. There was a. I think this is a true story. Arbulet told it. it has to be true. He's kidding. I think it's a true story. But anyway, there was a pastor who had a group of a church and they had Christian school and the Christian school had a no dancing rule for good reason. Obviously, um, uh, the kind of dancing goes on our culture today, male and female, is not, not good at all for keeping young people pure. 
So, um, so they had no dancing rule. Well, the young people kept coming to the pastor and bugging him and trying to get him to like give good reasons why he was against it and trying to trying to argue with his reasons to try to get him to change his standards. So they said, they said, you know, pastor, dancing has nothing to do with boy and girl and arousing your desires or anything like that. It's really just fun and it's just exercise. That's what they told the pastor. So could you please reconsider your ban on dancing? So the pastor said, I'll tell you, well, I'll give it a little bit of thought and I'll get back to you. Because you say it's all for fun and it's for exercise. It is not about boy and girl. Okay, all right. So uh, he took a few days and he came back and said, okay, he said, I made a decision. So the young people gathered and said, what did you decide? And he said, so I decided you're, you're right. If dancing is for fun and it's for exercise, then there isn't anything wrong with it, and why should I be banning it? So I decided I'm going to allow dancing. Yay! They got all excited. And he said, and since it's not about boy and girl, it's only for fun and exercise, we're going to have the boys dance on Tuesday, and have the girls dance on Wednesday. That was his decision, and you can see, you kind of know how that went, right? So you can see that that is the difference. But you know, those of you, I mean, uh, Mrs. Olson was posting about Filler on Roof last night. Filler on Roof, you watch them dance, the men were dancing, right? So... Dancing, as far as just moving your body, is an expression of joy. As long as you're not dressed really skimpy and trying to, you know, and trying to arouse uh, desire in people with your body. Obviously, just moving your body to music as a symbol of joy. There's nothing wrong with that. This is a picture of joy. So that's David. David is so excited at the ark coming, and he's dancing before the Lord with all his might. So he's just leaping and jumping and excited. It probably was kind of like a camp meeting in the south where they run around the the, uh, the tabernacle. Okay. So he's all excited. David is girded with the linen ephod. Now, what he did was, I'm obviously, you know, kings, they had these big robes. And, and obviously, those heavy robes and the crown and everything, that doesn't work for dancing, right? So obviously, David's like, man, I'm going to have a good time praising the Lord. So he takes off his crown. If he was wearing one, he takes off all his heavy robes. And he's just wearing his linen ephod, which is not immodest, but it was just something simple that he could dance in. So he, but here's the thing. He doesn't look like a king. He's not acting like a king. You know what he's acting like? He's acting like someone who's in love with God and wants to praise and worship God. And you know what? He doesn't even care what he looks like. That's not his focus. Which is really what we need to be like as God's people. We really need to be people who love God and want to please him and follow him. And we're not ashamed of him. And we're not ashamed to talk about him. And we're not worried about what people think of us or if we're such dignified Christians. That's, a, that's so important. We need that, okay? So <clears throat> this is what's going on. He came up, David and all the house of Israel, brought up the ark of the Lord with shouting, and with the sound of the trumpet, and the ark of the Lord came into the city of David, Michael, Saul's daughter. Emphasis there. Every time it says her name, talks about Saul's daughter. She's Saul's daughter. Looked through the window, through a window, and saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. All right, the title of the message is Be a David, Not a Michael. Okay. So let's talk about the difference between David and Michael. In this verse, verse 16, David was committed, but Michael was distant. David is leaping and dancing. He's committed to God. He's excited. He's praising the Lord. Michael is looking through a window. And she's despising her. She's very distant. David was committed. Michael was distant. You know, when I think of that, I think of how many Christians attend church occasionally, sing occasionally, read their Bible occasionally, and they look down and despise people who are in love with Jesus, people who talk about how much they love God, people who share their faith, people who are excited to be in church. They're there, but they're not there. Those are the kind of people that usually say, I could worship God just as good. Michael's probably thinking, I could worship God just as good out here looking through a window as I could down there with that embarrassing weirdo. David was committed. Michael was distant. I have a question. Are you a committed Christian or are you distant? Are you just kind of an observer? It's not about everybody being like everybody else. See, there are churches that are the opposite. There are churches where 
the Davids are going in and grabbing the Michaels and dragging them out into the street and saying, dance! I'm not talking about that. You know, there are that. There are churches where if everybody doesn't raise their hand, then you must not be spiritual. There are churches that tell you. I've, been, I've attended churches where they're like, everybody, everybody do this, everybody do that. And if you weren't like jumping up and down like a robot doing whatever the worship leader up front said, rub somebody's neck next to you. My parents were in a church that did that. Usually they're more like charismatic Pentecostal type churches. But literally, um, I, I, we were having church one time and at this one church and the guy was up front singing and leading and, and then the guy walked in a little bit late to church like, everybody give him a hug. Well, that's fine. If it was in Wisconsin, he wouldn't have had to say it, right? <laughs> but, but And then because every single person didn't run over and like mob the guy, then the guy got all angry and said, you guys aren't flowing with the spirit today. So listen, I'm not talking about David trying to force Michael to do something she wasn't comfortable doing. That's not the situation. The problem here is that Michael is despising David. David wasn't forcing anybody to dance. This is you worship God in your own way. Nobody's telling you how you have to act in church. You don't have to speak. You don't have to do anything. You can just worship God your own way. There wasn't any rules here. The problem was David was committed and Michael was distant. She's watching through a window going, I can't believe, like my dad. Well, yeah, I know he did a few bad things and died in battle with the Philistines, but my dad was a real king. My dad, he knew how to look dignified, respectable. That guy, he's messed up, jumping up and down, not wearing his kingly robes. What's he doing? There's really nothing wrong with a person showing how much they love God and doing things that might even embarrass other people. There's really nothing wrong with that. I'm not trying to tell you you need to do crazy, embarrassing stuff, but I'm saying as Christians, we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ and of the power of God and salvation. We should never be embarrassed to share our faith. We should never be embarrassed to be caught in public talking about God and the Lord. We should never be embarrassed to be seen praying, reading our Bibles. And you know what? At church, we should never be embarrassed just being ourselves in church. David just being himself. Well, you could be yourself in church, be able to praise the Lord, and no, it's nobody else's business. And you know what? Church does not need to be a place where we're all walking in thinking about what is everybody thinking and am I pleasing other people? Folks, we're here to pretty please God. And David was committed and Michael was distant. But then look at verse 20. Going down to verse 20, David returned to bless his household. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious was the king of Israel today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovered him, covereth himself. Now remember, she's saying that because he's not wearing his kingly robes. It wasn't that he was dressed inappropriate. I have heard people take Michael's critical statement and apply it and say, oh, he must have been exposing himself inappropriately. No, you don't take what the person who's doing the wrong thing in the Bible says about someone and say that's what happened. No, Michael is judging David. She's despising him in her heart. And um, and she is the daughter of Saul. So we don't take what Michael said as a fact. Michael is exaggerating what happened because she's trying to say, you weren't acting like a king, David. You were a king. You're not supposed to make a fool of yourself and just talk about how much you love God and sing and dance before the Lord. So number one, David was committed to Michael. It's just to number two, David was joyful, but Michael was critical. David was joyful, but Michael was critical. He's coming back to do what? To bless his household. I mean, they just had the most amazing day in their life where now the ark of God is in Jerusalem and nobody's dead. <laughs> That's a good day. Listen, we as a church, we've been through some stuff, haven't we? And we've experienced some negative consequences to sin. But you know, that doesn't mean that God doesn't have good things for us in the future. That doesn't mean that we can't have joy. That doesn't mean that we can't have the fellowship of the presence of God. And even though that stuff happened, now they moved on and they decided they were going to correct and they were going to be obedient, and now they're full of joy and excitement and happiness. David was joyful, but Michael was critical. Listen, we need to be careful, because if we're not careful, as Christians, we can get to a point in our life where we get used to it all. We get used to reading our Bible. We get used to praying. We get used to going to church. We get used to doing the Christian thing. And we get so bored with it, we're not excited anymore. And then we see somebody else who's excited. We see someone else who's having joy. We see someone else who's doing something. And then we just get critical. It can happen to any of us. 
can get that critical spirit. David was joyful. Michael was critical. Listen, be a David, not a Michael. Number one, David was committed. Michael was just, be a committed Christian. Don't be distant. Don't be all separating yourself from people and looking in on the outside, watching from a window, thinking, look at those people making an idiot out of themselves. We shouldn't be that way. We should be like, those are my people. They love God and I love God. They're saved and I'm saved. I want to be with God's people by David, not like Michael. But also David was joyful, but Michael was critical. Oh, we need to be careful and guard our hearts and our spirits so that we are joyful Christians. And I don't mean pasting a smile on your face. You know, that's such a, a stereotype of joy. That's not joy. Tell people, smile, smile. You never need to smile. Everybody smile. Listen, a lot of people are smiling and they're hiding darkness and bad things and they're not living for God. Don't get this thing, I always have to smile. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does say in everything, give thanks. We talked about what you're going to give thanks for last week. You give thanks for salvation. You give thanks for the Spirit. You give thanks for the Son. Not just pretend everything's fine in your life and taste a smile on your face like a crooked salesman. That's an aura. Crooked politician. We're not talking about that. Okay? But when it's, David was joyful, why was David joyful? He wasn't joyful because he's like, I'm the king and we're bringing the ark of God in Jerusalem. No, 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 no. David was joyful because he wanted to have fellowship with God. Listen, there is nothing more precious. This morning, I was reading this passage in Hebrew, and I was just putting to the finishing touch of my sermon. And it's just an amazing, amazing passage because David, David said in Psalm 27, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that... I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. You know, he was a king. He could have said, that I may have victory over my enemies, and that all of the men of Israel may bow themselves down to me. He didn't say that. He said, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life. He wanted to be with God's people. He said, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. There wasn't even a temple when David wrote that, but he knew his son was going to build one. David was joyful. He wanted to have fellowship with God. Listen, there's nothing more wonderful as a Christian than having fellowship with God. And you can have fellowship with God on your own, but you can also have fellowship with God when you're with God's people. David was joyful, but Michael was critical. She was just busy trying to figure out what everybody thought. And that's our next point. It's in verse 21. Verse 21, David said unto Michael, Listen to this. It was before the Lord. It was before the Lord. Why was I dancing, Michael? Why was I singing, Michael? Why was I happy? You're worried about the handmaids and what they think. But, Dave, but Michael, I was doing it before the Lord. And he says this, and it kind of feels like he's sticking the knife in and twisting it here. But I think that God wanted him to say this to Michael. He wanted him to remind Michael why her daddy wasn't the king no more. I really believe God wanted Michael to know that. He says it was before the Lord, who, which chose me before thy father, in, in other words, instead of your father, and before all of his house, and instead of your brother Jonathan, to appoint me ruler over the people of the Lord, over Israel, therefore will I play before the Lord. Talk about playing instruments and dancing. He says, Michael, I wasn't doing it for those handmaids. I wasn't doing it for everybody else. I was doing it for God. And by the way, Michael, your dad, that you want me to imitate, God removed him from being king because all he cared about was pleasing people. You think I'm going to be like your daddy? Think again. Because it didn't do, go very well with your daddy. Because all he cared about was what people thought. I don't know if you remember, but the time that Samuel said to Saul, God hath rejected thee from being king. You know what happened? He turned to walk away. And he said, come off for a sacrifice with me. And he, he turned to walk away. And Saul grabbed Samuel's robe. And he grabbed it and pulled and tore. His robe tore. And he said, the Lord hath rent the kingdom away from me. He said, God is showing you by, because you're trying to stop me from leaving. And he tore. God is showing you that he's tearing away the kingdom from you. And then Saul says this. Oh, I kind of missed one part. Before that, when Saul's making an excuse why he didn't obey, he said, I feared the people. 
because they wanted to offer sacrifice. So he was all about pleasing the people instead of obeying God, instead of pleasing God. And so he said, but honor me, I have sinned, but honor me before the people. That's what he said. Saul's like, I know I blew it. I know I lost the kingdom, but he's trying to make himself look good, even in his sin. Come, come offer sacrifice in front of the people. Honor me in front of the people. And, and, and Michael's like, David, what about the people? What are they going to think? The people aren't always thinking what you think they're thinking. Yes, there are a lot of unsaved people and carnal Christians that are going to despise you if you talk about how you much you love Jesus Christ and read your Bible and pray and attend church and worship the Lord and share the gospel. Yeah, there are going to be people who think you take that really seriously. You're kind of really obsessed with that, aren't you? Who do you think you are? Some kind of super duper saint? Yes, there are going to be people who do that. But there are going to be other people that you're going to inspire them to follow God because of your excitement to serve God. But David said, it was before the Lord. Michael. I was doing this for God. I wasn't doing it for the people. And by the way, your daddy only cared about the people. But you know what he said? But, but you know what that tells me? David was a God pleaser, but Michael was a man pleaser. David was a God pleaser. Michael was a man pleaser. Mike was always worried about what people thought. She wanted a husband who was dignified, who looked like a king. Remember, when David, when Samuel went to go anoint David, he looked at all the older ones. David was not very impressive. The Bible says he was ruddy, which means he was red. I don't know if that means he had like a reddish complexion or if it meant he had red hair. And he said he had a beautiful countenance, which is not a compliment to a boy. <laughs> Boys always talk, you're so beautiful. Boys only told me. Saul was the one who was really tough and he was like a head taller than everybody else. And you know what it says when David went out to fight Goliath? It says he disdained him because he was a youth and ruddy and with all of a beautiful countenance. Saul looked at it, I'm sorry, Goliath looked at David and he said, This is the guy that's gonna kill me. This is this is the <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's... Do that again. <laughs> you want me to fall too? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Remember like in Princess Bride? Yeah. <laughs> Cluck. <laughs> Nobody was impressed with David. But David was a man of God's own heart. The name Saul, Shaul, still a popular name in Israel today. I don't know why. But it means asked for, asked for. He was the one the people asked for. He was the popular one. David means beloved. He loved God and God loved him. And that's why God could use him. Listen, all you need to do is love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your might. You don't need to care what people think. It doesn't matter. David was a God pleaser, but Michael was a man pleaser. Be a David, not a Michael. David was committed. Michael was distant. David was joyful. Michael was critical. David was a God pleaser. Michael was a man pleaser. And then look at verse 22. Interesting statement. And I will yet be more vile than thus. No, vile in the Bible doesn't actually mean like evil. It actually means like unimportant or despised. And David said, I'll even be more despised than this. He says, Michael, do you think that that's the ultimate thing I would do to humiliate myself and to look like not very kingly? He said, I'll humble myself even more. He said, and will be base in my own sight. You know, when we come to church, when we live our lives as Christians, are we base in our own sight? If we're based in our own sight, if we don't think highly of ourselves, we'll be better Christians. Because we won't have to preserve this perfect public image that society tells us everybody has to have. David was not worried about his public image. Can you imagine if a video was made of David the king leaping and dancing like that, and it went viral? He probably would have got canceled. 
The king, did you hear the latest scandal? All the Moabites are scrolling through Twitter. <laughs> did you hear the latest scandal? Look at that guy. I mean, I mean, Saul, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, he, he had kind of a temper. He had some problems, but at least he looked like a king. Look at this weirdo. Can't believe it. Impeach him. <laughs> David was humble. Michael was proud. David was humble, Michael was proud. And this interesting thing he says here, he said, I will be more vile than thus and will be base in my own sight and of the maid servants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. See, what he's saying is this. He's saying, Michael, this is Israel. This is God's people. I know you probably forgot because of who your dad is, was. But we're God's people. He's probably thinking, Michael, do you remember what happened when they went through the Red Sea? And Pharaoh and his whole army drowned in the Red Sea. Remember what they did? Miriam the prophet, prophetess took a tambourine and said, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his riders he thrown into the sea. And there is a wrong kind of dancing. They did that on Mount Sinai and 3,000 people died in front of the golden calf. <laughs> But that was the right kind they were doing there where they were rejoicing because the horse and rider turned to the sea. I'm sure David's thinking, Michael, you really think all the people in Israel, these handmaids, are going to despise me and think I'm an idiot? Or do you think God's people are sick and tired of games and pretending to look good that they've had for 40 years under Saul and they are ready to worship the Lord? I think they were ready to worship the Lord. They were sick and tired of all the games. Of the maid servants which thou hast spoken of, of them shall I be had in honor. Listen, if you get excited about God, you start reading your Bible, and maybe you even tell somebody else something you learned. If you start praying and God answers your prayers, and you start telling people how God answered your prayers, you start sharing the gospel and people get saved. And you start telling people about people who got saved. If you come to church and a song just touches your heart and you go home and you sing that song over and over again and you're so excited about this, the song, maybe it was a special, maybe it was a song we sang. Heaven forbid you go to church and you hear a long sermon and God convicts your heart. And you don't even notice what time it is. And you go home and you say, man, that sermon changed my life. But I know it wasn't Pastor. He was jumping up and down like an idiot, like David. <laughs> it wasn't Pastor. It was the Holy Spirit talking to me. And the Pastor didn't even know I needed to hear that. He had no idea what was going on in my life. He was just being obedient to God. But God was the one who met with me in church. We had the Ark of God at church today. We had fellowship with God. And you're not embarrassed to tell everybody about that sermon, how much you love God and what he taught you and how it changed your life. David was humble. Michael was proud. Anyway, you do all of that, okay? I lost my train of thought because I went on and on about that. I was probably making a fool out of myself with David. <laughs> not comparing myself to David. But the part about making a fool of yourself, I think I got that with him, that part. I don't know if I got the good parts, but I got the, that part. <laughs> um, but you know, if you do all that, you might be thinking, no, I just want to stay a little bit distant and watch God's people through a window because I don't want to do anything to make a fool of myself and make somebody think I'm weird. You know what? It may just be that all the people that you think are going to think you're weird they're going to have you in more honor when they see you committed to God. See, David's telling Michael, Michael, you have the wrong idea. You think all the people in Israel are going to despise me because of what I did. But you know what I think, Michael? I think the people in Israel are going to respect me more because they know that now they don't have a king that's trying to please people. They have a king that's trying to please God. Be a David, not a Michael. The last point was very sad. Verse 23. Therefore Michael, look at this again, the daughter of Saul, 
Funny how it keeps mentioning that she's Saul's daughter, isn't it? Had no child to the day of her death. That's a sad ending. There are so many Christians that are that have no fruit in their lives because they're distant, critical, man pleasers, proud. They have no fruit. Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child until the day of her death. So Michael was barren. But what about David? Matthew chapter 1. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. I don't have that memorized. <laughs> All the way down to David begat Solomon of her, the heaven, the wife of Urias. Hey, listen, David messed up bad. But he had Solomon by Bathsheba, her that had been the wife of Urias. And it keeps going down until Jesus Christ. David was the line of the Messiah. Michael had no child to the day of her death. She was barren. David was fruitful, but Michael was barren. Listen, you can do a lot of dumb things in your life. You can mess up really bad, like David messed up really bad. I'm not giving you permission to, and you wouldn't give yourself permission to because you know how terribly it turned out, all of David's sin. But listen, oh, Michael never did any sin like that. No, she didn't. She never got into anything terrible. She was a pretty good person. But you know what? She was barren. You know why? Distant, critical, a man pleaser, and proud. There is a saying, isn't there? I think it's attributed to Abraham Lincoln. To escape criticism, say nothing, do nothing, be nothing. That was Michael. Oh, well, she didn't say nothing. But you know what I mean? She wasn't doing anything for God. But she was busy criticizing other people who were doing, who were just full of joy and in love with the Lord. Therefore, Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child the day of her death. And look at the contrast between Michael and David. You can go over to Luke. And there's a different genealogy in Luke, isn't there? A lot of people say, oh, that's because it was through Mary. Go read the genealogy. Both of them mention Joseph, not Mary. Mary is not in either of the genealogies. Joseph is in both of them. The other genealogy is just another line of the bloodline that goes back to David. And it's through a different son he had, not Solomon, a son he had called Nathan. And you can go to that genealogy in Luke, I believe it's Luke chapter 3. And it says, Jesus began to be about 30 years of age, being, as it was supposed, the son of Jacob, no, Joseph, which was the son of Jacob, which was the son of, and it goes all the way back through, and David's in there too. Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child of David or death. David actually had two lines that descended to Jesus Christ. Two separate lines. Amazing. The way that they intersect at the end. A lot of people go, well, how can Joseph, Joseph has two different fathers in, in the genealogy. How can that be? Just to explain that briefly, I can talk to you more about it later, but there are people who lived back then who have historical records um, that say that what happened in that situation is you had two brothers that uh, had um, two different fathers but the same mother, and one of them died and the other one married and then raised up children. So Joseph had actually two fathers. One was a father who was his legal father, and the other father was his biological father. And so that's how the, the lines could be separate and then come back, and then it would have two different fathers for Joseph in the genealogy. But either way, isn't that amazing? That, ge that the genealogy for Jesus through David actually could go through two lines and get to Jesus Christ. David was fruitful, but Michael was barren. Listen, what a terrible thing would it be to get to the judgment seat of Christ and you lived a barren life. It's so sad. Be a David, not a Michael. Be a David, but not a Michael. David was committed. David was joyful. David was a God pleaser. David was humble. And David was fruitful. 
Maybe you have times in your life where you're like a mite. Maybe you're kind of an observer out and watch, watching through a window, despising somebody who's excited about serving God, pleasing God. If you're that, you can change. You can become a David. You can say, you know what? There's nothing better than having fellowship with God. I want to please God, not men. I really want to have a close walk with God. I want to learn about the joy of fellowship with God. That was the whole point. God said, I want you to make me a tabernacle and I may dwell among them. And he said, there will I meet with thee and I will commune with thee from between the cherubim above the mercy seat, which is above the testimony that I have given the commandment of the children of Israel. God wanted to have fellowship with people. Listen, God wants to have fellowship with you. God wants to have fellowship with me. And listen, the longer you have fellowship with God and the more you grow in your faith, the more there are going to be times where other people are going to think you're stupid and you are going to be having the time of your life. And you're not going to care. David didn't care. And you won't either. It's not as scary as you think making a fool of yourself. It's actually quite fun when you're doing it for God. Be a David, not a Michael. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, when I read this passage, I see that what I see in America today is nothing new. 3,000 years ago, people cared about pleasing people, and they didn't care about pleasing God. And people played games there, just like they do today. Saul played a game. Michael wanted David to play a game. Father, I pray that Dells Baptist Church would be a place where we could come, and we could be ourselves, and we could worship God and not care what people think. I pray, Father, that we would be Davids and not Michaels. I pray, Father, that we would be fruitful. Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, he was of the line of David. He was descended from David. He did not care what people thought of him. He only lived to please God. And people made fun of him, and people mocked him, and people said that he was the prince of devils, and he didn't care. The Bible said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Father, help us to be willing to bear our cross, obey you, and not be ashamed of the gospel, and to do it for the joy that's set before us. Help us to be like David, not like Michael. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.